Okay, Energy 808, the cutting edge here on a given Monday. And we're here with Marco Mangelsdorf. Well, we're here with him virtually, but in fact, Marco is in Thailand. Uh, hi, Marco. Thanks for joining the show. Well, a very good morning to you, my dear friend Jay and Sawadika from Bangkok. Yes, indeed. We, we span the globe in the search of, of nuggets for ThinkTech and, and all listeners and viewers. Yeah, so you're in Bangkok. I'm envious, actually. But you were mentioning before the show that Bangkok has had a, a dry season this year. Can you talk about it? Yeah, it's not just Bangkok. It's across the region. Uh, I read just recently in the Bangkok Post yesterday, in fact, that it's the driest season of uh, the past 10 years. And this uh, this is rather apropos and, and scarily so in that uh, I, I read as well in this particular piece in the Post that uh, it's estimated that within the next handful of years, almost a third of the world's population will be in a water scarce or water uh, security uh, problem. And that's certainly uh, the case in parts of Southeast Asia that depends so much on uh, the Mekong River for its sustenance for, for millions of people. And that's not an exaggeration. And the, the water for the Mekong starts in the, the southern parts of China in, in high altitudes, and they have quite a few dams up there, and, and that's where the Mekong you know, begins this mighty journey for, for its great distance until it ends, ends up in the, uh, the, the Saigon uh, River, or uh, near Saigon uh, in Vietnam, South Vietnam, the Mekong River Delta. So that the long and short of it is there's a tremendous amount of politics uh, that's going on, has been going on, uh, mm -hmm. regarding water here uh, as more and more dams get put up, and there's the friction over uh, the Chinese and other upstream countries releasing adequate amounts of water so that the downstream downstream people can can do what they need to do. So I'll actually be in the Wang Prabang, uh, one of my favorite Asian cities, right on the Mekong in Lao, Laos PDR, uh, in several days. So it'll be very, very interesting to see just what that river level is um, during this dry, a very dry season. Yeah, water is everything in Southeast Asia, and so much of it comes from the Mekong, and that comes from China. Uh, so it must affect agriculture. It must affect life in general to be short on water, right? That's why there's friction, right? Well, agriculture and the number of people, Jay, along and close to the Mekong that rely on fish, catching fish, processing fish products, it's huge. I mean, we're talking millions of people who, for generations, you know, going back for, for a very, very, very long time, rely on the Mekong for the sustenance of, for them and sure. their families and for, for a very important source of protein. So it's really a big deal in terms of uh, what happens to the water, who controls it, how much water comes down the river at any given time. It's, it's a very big deal. You know, Marco, one of my, one of my favorite uh, news sources, uh, in fact, my favorite news source at the top of the heap is the New York Times. And you mentioned to me that uh, you have a cousin who lives in, in Bangkok, Hannah Beach is her name, and she writes for the New York Times, and you've seen her on this trip. Can you talk about what it's like to be a reporter, a journalist for the New York Times uh, in Southeast Asia, in Thailand? Yeah, it's pretty wild. Let me give you just a little bit of background about uh, my cousin Hannah. Uh, my uncle, Kai's Beach, uh, he served in the U.S. Marine Corps uh, in World War II. He was actually a, a, a war correspondent, a hard scrabble kid who came from a, a, a small town in poor rural Mississippi and rose his way up to be one of the top-notch foreign correspondents in the American Press Corps, won a Pulitzer Prize covering uh, Korea, the Korean conflict. And uh, his third wife, Yuko Beach, uh, a Japanese national. They had one kid, one child, and that was Hannah, Hannah Beach. So she's actually Hapa, Hapa Haole and, and Japanese. And she followed in her papa's footsteps, much to uh, to my, my great pride and her father and mother's pride. And she worked for years and years as a, a reporter for Time Magazine and living mostly in, Be in uh, Beijing and Shanghai. And uh, two and a half years ago or so, the New York Times made a play on her, and she switched over to the Times and became a Southeast Asian bureau chief based here in Bangkok with her, with her husband, Brooke, who's a journalist in his own right, and two just really sweet, sweet sons uh, who are 
about eight and, and ten years old and yeah, she's a fantastic writer, Jim. I'm so impressed by Hannah, and I got a chance to have a lovely lunch with her just a couple of days ago here. And she's covered some some really incredible stories, including the the tragedy, uh, the genocide of the uh, of the Rohingya uh, in in Burma, Myanmar, who were chased out by the nationalist Buddhist uh, government there, led by. Aung San Suu Kyi, who has taken, according to a lot of people, quite the fall from grace from, from winning the Nobel Peace Prize years ago to being uh, something of, uh, of a nationalist uh, uh, who has been very uh, supportive of what the military has been doing in that part of Burma. So she kind of has covered that, spent time in that huge refugee camp there in Bangladesh, it's about 100,000 people, and covered the South China Sea stuff between uh, China, which which protests against the U.S. naval and air and, and air force presence there in the region. So, yeah, she's really in a hot spot here, uh, and been able to cover a lot of incredibly juicy stories. And I, I so appreciate what she's doing. And she's, I'd say, early 40s, and just has a very sweet and and yet incredibly Akamai approach to to journalism and. Uh, and uh, a real pleasure to be able to see her. Yeah, it is a great career, isn't it? I mean, and this kind of, um, you know, posting really suggests how wonderful it can be. Um, be with your professional spouse and uh, do stories like that. Um, I think, I think um, you know, young people ought to focus on doing that. You know, in the old days, I would suggest people they should join the State Department. I'm not sure I feel the same way about it now, but I do feel that, that way about journalism, especially overseas journalism. So we'll be looking for her byline in the New York Times, Hannah Beach, B-E-E-C-H, right, Marco? Correct, yeah, and actually she hails from, from a company that did quite well for quite a number of years called Beechcraft, a, uh, a manufacturer of, uh, of aircraft, American aircraft. I'm not sure, I think they're still in business. They, they do primarily, I think, small, small aircraft uh, yeah. for private use, not commercial. Yeah. General use, aviation, so yeah. Well, let's uh, let's aviate back to uh, Hawaii for a moment. Uh, you've been doing, as you always do, analysis of uh, the various uh, sources of uh, renewable energy, and of course, the big one uh, for you and Provision Solar and Hilo, your company, um, is uh, solar. So you, you made some calculations recently about how it's doing, and you actually have a chart about how it's doing. Can we talk about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. In fact, I just submitted a piece uh, to the Civil Beat on the subject, kind of my year-in-review annual uh, take on what's going on in the solar industry in Hawaii, which I've been a part of for quite a number of years. and. The good news is that, uh, good news for me and, and those of us in the industry and, and the state at large, I would also add, is that the, uh, the solar coaster, as we've come to call it, which is the, uh, the, the nature or the volume of business that's being done, uh, affects the solar coaster either going up or going down, depending on the, the month, depending on the year. And the solar coaster uh, for Hawaii, across the, the four counties of, of our state, uh, went up uh, by 41 percent this past uh, year in 2019, which uh, after two down years or two slow years of, of solar coastering, so to speak, uh, in 2017 and 2018, the solar coaster went up uh, from, uh, I'm going to get the number for you in a moment. Yeah, let's see uh, the chart, in 2018, too. 4,830 PV permits across the state in 2018 and 6,824 6, in 2019, which represented a net gain of uh, 41%, which uh, is uh, nothing that's needs that. So we had the best year in terms of uh, PV permits, at least across Hawaii, last year compared to, or the best year since 2016. So, you know, why that is, yes. uh, I think... Large, well, one, one significant factor uh, a lot of us believe is that the federal investment tax credit, which is uh, 30%, covers 30% of the cost of the system, whether you're a homeowner or a business owner, uh, essentially it's kind of free money in a sense from the feds if you can uh, deduct the cost of the system or have a credit 
of 30% of what you paid uh, for your TV system, you can use that to offset your tax liability. And that uh, federal investment tax credit has been available since George W. Bush in 2005. And it actually, uh, which is something we all knew, was going to go down from 30% to 26 percent as of two weeks ago as in january 1st so mm -hmm. my point being is that it's been shown to my satisfaction that when it comes to decision making behavior uh, individuals typically are more motivated to act at the prospect of losing something uh, as the prospect of loss of value uh, as opposed to uh increasing their value in other words if, for example if you're if your stock worker calls and says, Jay, you know, you really need to sell XYZ stock in the next couple of days fast because it's likely to go down, you're probably going to be more motivated to follow his or her advice than if the, the same analyst said, Jay, this is a deal you cannot pass out. You've got to get in now. Plastics, my son, plastics, you know, going back to, uh, to that classic film of the 60s, The Graduate. So... Yeah, I think a big uh, a big motivator was the the perception or the fear that they were going to the buyers were if they waited uh, till the next year they were going to lose money that's on the table for them now, and uh, storage as well. Energy storage has been uh, a bigger part of the equation last year compared to the year before and, and the year before that. So batteries have become much more mainstream. About seventy plus percent of all. New PV systems permitted uh, have energy storage, which I think is a very, very good thing. And, uh, you know, beyond that, Jay, I'm, I, I, I'm humble enough to admit and acknowledge that even though I've been tracking this industry for a long, long time and I've been in the industry for even longer, I'll be darned sometimes if I know what the damn solar culture is going to do year to year. So, yeah, and it could, you know, it could go be year, that there are other factors outside, outside of energy that affect people's buying decisions. But let me, let me uh, ask you about the decisions of the legislature. And I think uh, there was a piece, I think it was your piece, about uh, tax credits for storage. We haven't got that straightened out. And in fact, opening day is this Wednesday, uh, day before your birthday, I might add, um, and as far as I know. And, uh, you know, they should be considering tax credit for storage, don't you think? They should be wrapping it around so people buy storage, invest in storage, and that will help uh, develop solar be be good for renewables in general, don't you think? I, I couldn't agree more. And you know, based on the, the the practical political reality that a separate tax state tax credit for storage failed in the past four consecutive legislatures or legislative sessions, uh, the more cynical side of me does not have much hope that they're going to get a right this session plus you know, the reality as well as jay that i'm kind of a lone voice uh, from what i can tell in the renewable energy industry in the state calling for this tax credit so in other words it doesn't appear to be much of a priority for my uh, my brethren and my sister in making that word up uh in renewable energy here who don't seem to believe uh, that, that it should be made a priority because you know the, the the gig of the ledge, you know you choose your priorities, you hit hard, you try to get them passed, but you 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 don't bring in a whole wish list of ten or fifteen things. So you know you want to be targeted in what you want and try to get. And I, I don't seem to have a whole lot of support from what I can tell from others to uh, to go and make this a top priority. Well, that's really too oh, bad well. because it's a, it's an obvious benefit, and we're going to have to do it after a while. And it. It smooths the curve. It's uh, it's a statement of efficiency. Uh, it's really uh, a critical piece to get to uh, clean energy goals by 2040, 2045, whatever. And so, um, you well, know, I'm, I'm sad that the legislature hasn't done anything. Well, and plus, Jay, the, the I mean, I don't know if you've been watching or reading the news out of Puerto Rico the past week. I mean, those four people got clobbered by multiple, you know, substantial earthquakes. And it's found that, you know, that once again, you have many, many Puerto Ricans who are suffering big time in the dark. The point being is that even after spending billions of dollars to, uh, to, to fix that grid, to upgrade the grid, there's still a lot that needs to be done. More billions need to be spent. But it just drives home again to me. You know, my hair is on fire with this kind of stuff. That we have an ostrich-like mentality in the state of Hawaii uh, where 
hardening the grid, uh, having more distributed solar, renewable energy, and storage should be made to me uh, a, a very top priority, at least as important as as uh, having AC in, in the public schools. I mean, I'm, I'm saying that kind of tongue-in-cheek a little bit. That hasn't uh, worked out very Are we well. waiting? Are we the yeah, AC in the public schools. For a category? Yeah, right. Well, we are waiting because it will happen. You know, it's not a question of uh, weather, but only when. So let me ask you about hydrogen, where it fits, you know. There was only a little conversation about this at the uh, legislative briefing, uh, the Hawaii Energy Policy Legislative Briefing uh, in the State Capitol Auditorium last Friday. That's one business day ago. Um, and, it, you know, it strikes me that people and the legislature, they don't fully understand the value of, of using hydrogen as a way to store. It is a storage mechanism. Furthermore, it is a transportation mechanism in the sense that you can get the hydrogen in one place and, and ship it in a, in a tank to another place and then leave it there until you need it. Um, batteries are hard to move around, but uh, tanks of hydrogen are easier. Uh, where does hydrogen fit in all of this? Is hydrogen a, a complement to batteries? Um, do you think there's a place for it going forward? And what is that place? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have to be all in, in, in the state of Hawaii, given our continued, again, hair on fire reality of more than 80 percent of the state's energy is, is imported in the form of oil to the state in more than 80 percent, despite decades and decades and decades of efforts to reduce our, our dangerous addiction and dependence on oil. So uh, I, hydrogen is definitely part of the mix. You know, the key part of, 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 of ramping up hydrogen production, infrastructure distribution and use is to be able to produce it in a cost-effective fashion, mm -hmm. right? And in order to produce it, you have to have, uh, or you have to have a demand for it. So as we've talked about with people like Paul Fonchu, there are Blue Planet and others, you know, the supply and demand has to be carefully calibrated. And that's kind of where we're at now, just at the beginning. And, you know, ideally, uh, renewable energy in the form of, let's say, solar or wind that doesn't have any place to go, let's say, when, when the grid at any given time can't uh, necessarily uh, take all that renewable energy and as we have hundreds of megawatts of more renewables coming online hopefully in the next handful of years there will be more time during peak generation from these renewable sources when this energy this renewable energy could and should be used to electrolyze water which we typically have no shortage of uh, including of course recently with these torrential rains across much of the state electrolyze water with renewable energy and uh, and produce hydrogen store it and use it uh, but we're just at the very very beginning of this this rather long and arduous slog i think it's going to be to to have hydrogen a part of our energy economy but yeah i mean we have to be all in with evs which are growing year to year to year but also hydrogen which has uh, as a as a as an energy carrier energy source has a lot of uh uh, attributes uh, in terms of what you can do with it and, and uh, both transportation and power generation. So, yeah, we, we should be all in with hydrogen because uh, we still have a hell of a long way to go to, to beef up our, our independence and our energy security. Yeah, I mean, it's a very important discussion, and, and it should always, um, that every discussion of renewables should include a discussion on, on storage, on tax credits to incentivize storage, on hydrogen, on tax credits for hydrogen in the same way. Um, and, I, and I would like to see that discussion continue. Uh, the Energy Policy Forum um, meeting last Friday was, uh, was interesting. There was some inspired speakers there. Um, our friend uh, Jennifer Potter was there. She was terrific. And Scott Sue was very good, the newly anointed uh, uh, CEO of Hawaiian Electric. And others were good, too. I'm looking forward to more discussions like that. But, uh, Marco, let's take a short break. When we come back, I would like to uh, take a look with you at uh, the latest news on PGV in the Big Island in Puna and see what geothermal looks like in this mix, this portfolio of renewables. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real 
and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Hi guys, I'm your host Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier, and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you. And uh, aloha. Okay, Energy 808, the cutting edge. And we have Marco Mangelsdorf on the phone from uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And we're talking about all kinds of things, including things in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, energy, uh, everywhere that it, that it is of issue. And that really is everywhere in the world. Uh, gee, before we go too much further, I want to I ask you one thing that occurred to me while you were talking about uh, the, the dry period in, um, in Thailand, Marco. Uh, do people attribute that? Is it properly attributed to climate change or is it just a matter of a, a water shortage from the dams the Chinese are building upstream in the Mekong? I think it's both, Jay. I think it's both. Uh, um, there is a, a commission uh, that is made up of uh, the Chinese, the Thais, Cambodians, Laos, and Vietnamese, and uh, people from, folks from Burma, Myanmar. Uh, because uh, the Mekong is a common resource. So there's definitely discussion going on and, uh, and cooperation to some extent. But, you know, the cooperation has its limits, right? And especially if there is a greater demand for water than there happens to be supply mm -hmm. at any given time. Yep. So it's, it's a rather, rather hot and, 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 and friction-laden uh, topic at times. Yeah. Well, you know, a, a climate change is all the more important. Um, I'm afraid uh, that the world isn't doing that much about it, not not dealing dealing with it properly. I mean, we we, we might uh, react to storms, extreme weather, but we, we should try to avoid fossil fuel. We should, um, you know, uh, have mechanisms by which uh, emissions are reduced. Um, and the fact that the United States is denying as a, as a country, as a nation, is denying climate change through uh, Donald Trump is very troubling, not only in the United States, but in the world. Um, because, because as the United States goes in this regard, so goes the world. If we're not excited about it, if we're not doing anything about it, and indeed we're not, um, then, you know, the world is going to do less. And the result is, uh, as, a, as a species, we're, we are at greater risk. And, you know, um, and the, other, the other thing about it is that, um, you know, before we talked about energy, um, and we weren't we weren't really dealing so much on a global level. We were dealing maybe on a more local level. But now I think we have to deal with climate change on a global level. And uh, you know, before we had environmental impact statements that really dealt with local impacts of local environments. Now what we do, our projects, however big or small, should also take into account. Uh, the, the global effect. It's like a global environmental impact statement as far as uh, climate change is concerned. Um, and more and more, I think we have to be, we have to be into that. And more and more, we should talk about it. But anyway, I wanted to get to Puna Geo Thermal Venture um, because now it appears uh, that it, coming back online, even even within the next few months, um, and you must be following that closely wherever you are. So. Uh, tell us what's happening as far as you know and what the impacts are. Yeah, big news, Jay, big news. I mean, not surprising news, but on December 31st, the uh, folks of PGV, Puna Geothermal, which is owned by Nevada-based ORMAT, an international company that uh, has geothermal and other resources throughout different parts of the world, they submitted a uh, amended and revised power purchase agreement to the Public Utilities Commission, which is something that the PUC has been wanting them to do for a while now as a precursor to getting that plant back online. And I, I had a chance to go 
with uh, the, the manager there, Mike Calacchini, big guy, uh, manager of PGV, went on a tour of the facility a couple several weeks ago, and it was really quite uh, jaw-dropping in terms of this this island of a power plant with all this infrastructure sprawling uh, around over quite a territory, surrounded on uh, almost all sides by lava. And uh, the the resourcefulness and the, the drive and dedication of, of, of PGV guys in ORMAT to bring this, pat, this plant back online and functional, you know, no shortage of, of, of serious money needed to, to, to do that. So the, the revised power purchase agreement is certainly would be, if approved, a better deal for Hawaii uh, electric ratepayers. The all-in cost of electricity under the new PPA would be, depending on how you calculate it, somewhere in the 10 to 11 cents a kilowatt hour range all-in, and compare that to the current avoided cost, which is the, uh, the, the, the pricing mechanism for the first 25 megawatts of that plant. The uh, avoided cost is in the 14 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour range right now, and that goes up as the price of oil goes up. So it, it's, it would be better economically for Alco, and therefore better for Big Island residents. And the other news uh, that was uh, welcomed by a lot of people is that the output of that plant would go up from a max 38 megs to somewhere around 46. So if that were to happen, if the commission approves when, when, if and when PGB does come back online, which uh, they certainly want to come back online, Helco wants them to come back online, a lot of people on the island want them to come back online, it would uh, bring up the renewable percentage uh, after the first full year of operation from the current uh, somewhere around the low 40s, which is what I think one electric will report Helco to be for 2019. It'll bring it up to somewhere in the 70 plus range. So we would be 70% renewable in power generation, 70 plus percent uh, with PGV coming back online, which would instantly evolve the Big Island back to the number one position, which we were in for quite a number of years until, until uh, the eruptions of 2018, which knocked out that plant in May of that year. So, yeah, my crystal ball would say that it's going to be probably several months uh, until the commission... Uh, makes an official ruling. It could be sooner. And then uh, my guess is going to be four to eight months uh, until, assuming they get approval, uh, regulatory approval, four to eight months until they're up to full power and providing those dozens of megawatts to, to Helco. Right now they're in testing mode and, uh, you know, so far so good from what I understand. And, and, uh, We'll see how, how that plays out. It's all good. It's all good to have a, 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 var a variated, um, uh, a diversified portfolio. Uh, it's all good to have. Um, it all, it's all good to have uh, geothermal, and it's all good to to see a company that has the what do you call it business will and resources to come back like this after such a devastating uh, eruption. Anyway, uh, Marco, great to talk to you. We're out of time. Uh, but I look forward to our next conversation. I want you to enjoy your trip and learn a lot about everything. And when you come back, when we speak next in a couple of weeks, um, I'm hoping we can find out what you've learned. Thank you, Marco. Well, absolutely. I'll be in uh, Luang Prabang, uh, the city along the Mekong, in two weeks. And I look forward to, uh, to talking uh, more with you, Jay, and, uh, and picking up right where we left off, my friend. And again, happy, happy New Year. How old are Marco? He go to you, sir. Shinya and Kwaila, Marco. Thanks so much. Aloha. You're welcome. Thank you.